All right, Dr. DeWall, welcome to the Man Talk Show. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm okay. Yeah, wonderful. Well, listen, I've seen your work around for a while now, and I've been diving into it and uh, listening to conversations that you've had in the past, and I, I find your your research um, wonderfully fascinating. And so it, it really truly is an honor. I was telling my podcast producer last night, I was like, there's not many, I don't get nervous uh, for interviews anymore. But for some reason, I felt a little uh, background noise of like, don't say something stupid. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you managed to do what most, most guests uh, uh, don't do, which is, I, you know, I feel a, a deep respect for you and your work. And, and so there's, there, I'm just getting well, then, the nerves uh, out of the way. I, I suggest not to say something stupid. Anymore. That's right. Yeah, that's good. That's good. We'll just reinforce it. Um, all right. Well, let's begin where I always begin these conversations, which is tell us a story about a defining moment in your life. I've had many defining moments with my primates. But if you talk about human affairs, I was, I was a young student. I was maybe um, 25 or something. And I gave a lecture in, in the UK. I, I, I'm from the Netherlands, so I had to travel to the UK. I gave a lecture. I was very nervous. It was my first uh, official uh, congress and so on. And afterwards, an American, uh, his name is Bob Goy, he came to me. He was the director, director of a primate center in Wisconsin. And uh, he came to me and said, you need to come to the US. I didn't think my talk, you know, was like 12 minutes. I don't think it was so impressive, but he absolutely wanted to have me. And so it was a very important moment in my career because I, I moved to the U.S. and I liked it there and, and I, I, I'm still here. <laughs> Do you still go back and forth? Because um, you, you back, back to Europe. I, I'm very Warsaw. often in Europe. Uh, I have a condo in Utrecht uh, in the Netherlands. And so I'm very often there, yeah. Nice, nice. I haven't been to the Netherlands, but it's on the, it's on the list. So maybe I'll, I'll have to it's email you and get some... Must. Uh, I'm go now going to the Vermeer exhibit in Amsterdam, which has gotten so much attention. And v Vermeer has only painted like, what is it, 30 paintings. And so it's not yeah. a very big, big exhibit, but it's very important, I think. Very cool. Very cool. Well, let's kind of get into your work because I think there's so much for us to cover. And I, I want to just start, start high level and then we'll work our way down to some more of the, the nitty gritty Let's just begin with what's the role of a, a primatologist for the layman person and what would you say the, the research that you do is largely used for? Well, primatologists come in multiple types. You have the ones who work in the field. Very important, of course, that we have those still. We still have primates in the field also. I'm sort of in between. I'm not really a lab worker. I, work, I prefer to work with large groups of primates in captivity. Uh, because I can not only observe them more closely than you can do in the wild, but also I can do certain experiments, uh, behavioral experiments on them. And then you have, of course, also people who work in labs. That's a very different thing, but because that's often medical and I'm, I'm not involved in medical studies at all. So, and then the, the research between those different fields, what would that be used for? Like, it, is it for us to better understand ourselves as, as human beings? Is it to understand just primate culture? Is there overlap there? Most primatologists, they will say that they're interested in the animals themselves. So, so in my case also, I'm, I'm not working on chimpanzees and bonobos in order to understand humans. I want to understand these animals. But it is, of course, with that kind of species who are so close to us, because they're our closest relatives, it's obvious to draw parallels and to see how it extends to human behavior. So automatically you get involved in that. But the first goal, I think, is to understand how these animals live, what they do, how smart they are, and so on. I have a series of questions that I'm, I want to go through in, in terms of you know your work and this recent book, which is called Different Gender Through the Eyes of a Primatologist. But I'm curious, as you've done this work, because it's been decades now, I'm, I'm curious what was surprising when you first got into this field? Like, was there anything that sort of took you back as you started to study primates and chimps and bonobos that sort of caught you off guard that you wouldn't expect? Do you, have you built a sort of camaraderie with, with some of them? When I was a student, um, everyone was interested in aggression and violence. <laughs> this was right after, right after uh, World War II, was a sort of ah. obvious obsession. And uh, a famous person, Conrad Lawrence, had written a book about aggression, how aggression is an, is an instinct that we cannot get rid of and we're all going to be aggressive now and then. And so everyone was studying that. Also in humans, actually, many studies on aggression at the time. 
And uh, I discovered in that period of time that chimpanzees kiss and embrace after a fight. So they, so they reconcile after fights. And bonobos later, I discovered bonobos do that too, but they, they do it more sexually than the chimps. So I got really interested in that process. I got interested in conflict resolution and, and how do you get over violence and how do you re- restore relationships afterwards? And I found that more fascinating than the aggression itself. So, so I think that was my first surprise is that even though I was in charge of studying aggression, I ended up studying conflict resolution. I love that. And that's, that's fascinating. But do you find that the research that's happening within the scientific field or, or specifically within your field uh, largely coincides with social issues and, and what's happening within the culture? Are those two things separate? Are they interconnected from your, from your view? They're not easy to separate. Because, uh, for example... You must have heard about the selfies gene and and Richard Dawkins and so on. That came up in the time that Thatcher and Reagan were talking about how it's best to create a competitive society with a lot of open capitalism, unregulated and so on. And and so that's the time that the biologists were talking about how selfies we were. And and I think those things were connected. And then uh, later, now we're talking about how cooperative we are. And we are such a cooperative species. That's what everyone now says. But, you know, uh, 40 years ago, we were a selfie species. And so I think, I think these things fluctuate with the times and with the, 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 the mood in the, in the culture, so to speak. I think that all has an effect. So, so, for example, when Obama became president, he started talking about empathy. And, and that's exactly the time that we biologists, we got interested in empathy in animals. Uh, I, th- I think these things are always connected somehow. Yeah, I, th- I think that's the thing that I found interesting, you know, as I've had more and more researchers, scientists, you know, different types of psychologists on the show, that there's just this sort of interconnectedness between what's emerging and bubbling up in consciousness and culture and what we're naturally gravitating towards trying to figure out through science. It's almost like the ideas that are purported and pushed forward culturally are the ones that science then is, is either has already been working on and it's sort of emanating into the collective consciousness or it's something that science then says, okay, let's go and see if we can prove, disprove or, or steel man, you know, or any of these. Yeah, I, th- I think all these backgrounds have an effect. So for example, gender has an effect on how you look at primates. When, when female primatologists became more prominent, we started looking at different things. The male primatologists were all obsessed with hierarchies and violence and territoriality and stuff like that. And then the female primatologists came and they were interested in family relationships and, and the lives of females and how you raise the young and so on. And so we, we got different questions. It's also culturally the case. For example, I'm from the Netherlands. I've never had a taste for, uh, because the Dutch are not really a a warrior species, so to speak. I've never had a taste for warfare, and I've never believed in all these scenarios that the anthropologists, the American anthropologists come up with, which is that we evolved to be killing each other, basically. (laughs) That's really never been my taste. And so I also have a different perspective. I think every culture brings a different perspective, every gender, every background or so. Yeah, well, let's let's start getting into a little bit to to your work specifically. So, in this latest book, again, I'd like to just start high level, and then we'll we'll continue mm-hmm. to dig in um, down to some of the various topics. But what would you say is the sort of basic premise of your latest book or, or research um, in different and and why gender specifically? Is it something that you were inherently curious about, or is it a byproduct of observing? the primates, and then something that you were sort of sparked to try and, and, and observe? I give many lectures on, on animal intelligence, animal emotions, and so on. And each time I mention sex differences, I say the males do more of this, the females more of that, uh, there are questions afterwards, because people are very curious about sex differences in the primates. And I think it is because they read that uh, gender differences are cultural, they read that we can reduce them or eliminate them and raise our kids gender neutral. They read that gender is, is a very flexible concept. And, and then they want to hear from a primatologist what he thinks about that, because I think many people are skeptical about it, because, well, many people have raised boys and girls at home and they have noticed a few differences, even though they didn't necessarily think that they created them. 
And so uh, I wrote the book partly to satisfy that kind of curiosity. I thought the book was going to be mostly about sex differences in the primates and how they relate to what we see in humans. But it turns out, and I did not anticipate that before I wrote it, that I also know a lot of gender diversity in the primates because I've known many primates individually. And, uh, and I would say one in 10 individuals doesn't fit the mold. They, they may be female, but act like a male or a male and act like a female, or they have homosexual tendencies. And, uh, so there's all the gender diversity that we see in human society. We see also in primate society. And I got really interested in that. And as you may have noticed in the book, I pay quite a bit of attention to that too. So uh, the book became a bit different from what I thought, uh, but I think there is an intense curiosity in humans about gender because they hear so often that it is purely cultural, and that's, of course, impossible. There is nothing in humans that is purely cultural. Yeah, I've always found that sort of argument or take to be wildly fascinating, you know, when we could kind of go into that. But I mean, I I think it's always been interesting to me where where people are just sort of hooked on this idea that gender is purely cultural and that biology, you know, certain neurochemicals don't have any impact whatsoever. Physiology has no impact whatsoever. That for me has always been quite challenging, you know, having grown up I remember my wife and I were having a conversation and I asked her, you know, what was it like for you to go through puberty? And we had this lengthy discussion about what it was like for the two of us to go through puberty. And it was just such wildly different experiences. You know, I'm, I'm describing getting erections on the bus, you know, and in class embarrassingly and wanting to, you know, sort of be aggressive. And she's describing emotional volatility and ups and downs and, you know, socializing, all, all these sort of different experiences. And, I'm, and I've always kind of sat there thinking, how is that socialized? How, you know, how are those physiological responses socialized? It seems very challenging. So, so let's get into some of these nuances because that's, you know, I'm talking about personal experience, which is maybe not so research-based. <laughs> but uh-huh. let's talk about some of the basic premises of the book. So you talk about this notion that uh, gender is not 100% cultural, nor is it 100% biological. So where do we begin to draw the lines? Uh, Is there any notion of what does influence it within uh, primate culture um, and what might be a little bit more biological? Well, to draw a line is impossible. I know people want that and, and the media does that for them. They say this trait, let's say schizophrenia or something, this trait is 90% genetic and 10% cultural or uh, education. That's not not possible. You cannot um, tease these things apart because everything is an interaction between genes and the environment. And so it's an illusion to think that you can tease them apart. Uh, I would say with gender, we tend to think that humans have genders, but animals don't. Well, that's of course nonsense. A, A chimp or a bonobo is adult when they're 16 meaning that they have a very slow development. They learn a lot of things in their lifetime. And so they're just as affected as we are by what happens around them. And we know, for example, from the primate studies that young females tend to mimic adult females like their mom. Uh, Young males tend to mimic adult males who are around. They don't don't always know who their father is, but they see, of course, adult males. And so there is a lot of self-socialization going on in the young and I speak of genders in the primates too. And, and that interaction between nature and nurture is always there. It's, a, it's an illusion that you can tease them apart. The reason we have a gender duality is, of course, because we have two sexes, mostly two sexes. And um, th- these things cannot be teased apart. And so there's always some biology in your gender perception and your gender expression. Uh, and, and that's really not something that you can avoid. Why do you say mostly two sexes? What do you mean by that? Well, sex is, sex is mostly binary. I would say 99% binary, but it's not 100% binary. And, and we need to keep that in mind, I think. Uh, and when you say that, are you referring to like intersex or, or something? Yeah, yeah there's, there's all sorts of exceptions to it. And sometimes they, they are very uh, dramatic, like uh, a person who's born with two sets of uh, genitals, uh, male and female, that happens. But you also have all sorts of other exceptions where, for example, the hormonal profiles are not exactly as you would expect or chromosomal differences. And so there's there's all sorts of exceptions 
to the binary, but it is mostly binary. Do those differences show up within primate culture as well, or is that predominantly within, within the human species? Well, in, in animals, of course, it's very common. In the primates, I don't think we have good data on that, but hermaphroditic primates, they do occur, I think. But in, in the animal kingdom at large, you know, there, there's, there are species of fish that are born like a female and they end like a male. <laughs> so there's all sorts of variability. And so uh, if you t- take the animal kingdom at large, there's all sorts of exceptions to the binary, I would say. Interesting. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, you know, boys, girls within the primate cultures, whether it's chimp or bonobos, and how they play and how they sort of build social structures, because I think this is one of the interesting parts right out the gates within your book that you start to talk about. So (laughs) how do these gender differences uh, start to emerge within primate culture from a young age and and how they play? Do we see aggression differences between um, the males and the females? What starts to emerge? So at a very young age, the females, young females, are more interested in infants than the males. So if a mother arrives with a newborn baby, she's going to be surrounded by young females who want to hang out with her, touch the baby, hold it. And later when they are a bit more experienced, they will become the babysitters for uh, these these infants. So that's an interest that the females have in all primate groups. And, And if you give them dolls, for example, the females will carry these dolls on their belly, on their back, uh, try to nurse them, hold them against the nipple, uh, walk around with them. Uh, In the wild, uh, chimpanzee females have been seen, young females, to pick up wooden logs or rocks and carry them on their back or build a nest for them like they have a baby. So, So all the primate females, I think they have a very strong tendency to test out their maternal skills on the infants of others or on, on dolls that you, that you give them or that they make themselves. And, and that's absolutely essential because maternal care is not inborn. Everyone speaks about the maternal instinct, but actually maternal skills need to be learned. And this is one way the, that they learn them and how they get experience. And, and if they don't get that experience, they cannot raise offspring. So if, if for example, in a zoo, a gorilla female is pregnant and in that group, they have never had any baby uh, gorillas, you know it's going to go wrong. You know that that female is not going to be able to take care of the baby because Mm -hmm. she's not born with the skills. The skills need to be learned. So that's the female side, and that applies to all the primates. And, And also the human data is pretty clear on that, actually. And then on the male side, the males are very fond of wrestling and roughhousing and running around and beating up on each other, which is also essential for them. Because they need to learn fighting skills, but they also need to learn how to inhibit uh, their physical strength. Uh, When they play with a a weaker partner or play with an infant, they need to inhibit all these. And actually, your average dog does the same thing. If a big dog Mm -hmm. plays with a small dog, there's also a lot of inhibition involved. and, And that's all absolutely essential. And so that's what young males do. I myself, I'm from a family of six boys. Wow. And so I know the wrestling part of, uh, and the roughhousing part. Uh, I think that's what boys love to do. And, and that's why I'm a bit upset. I, I hear that in some American schools now, they have a no-touch policy among kids, which I think is horrible. During COVID, maybe that was a good idea. But I think um, boys really need this kind of uh, experience. And they love, they love that kind of mock fighting. And, and so why would you suppress it? I don't understand that. Yeah, it's, I, I have a two-year-old son, and I'm the oldest of five, although there's two girls and two boys. I was going to say below me <laughs> in age, <laughs> um, not necessarily in the hierarchy. But um, it's interesting to watch my boy as he's, you know, started to walk, started to sort of run, and this natural curiosity with his body, you know, launching himself off the couch, standing at the other end of the couch and running and just like torpedoing his body into mine. It's not something that I've told him to do because he doesn't talk yet. And it's not something that I've sort of tried to ingrain in him. It's just something that he seems to be curious about. And I, you know, I think about myself as a young boy and you know, those things were very strong as well. Which brings me to the question, why do we want to see ourselves in primate culture? Because I notice that I'm sort of trying, immediately drawing comparisons and, and connections between the two. And I think that that's a very natural thing that we do socially. Can yeah. you just speak to that? 
that's entirely logical because you are a primate. So, so if you see a primate, a chimpanzee, let's say, uh, he has hands like you, he has frontal eyes like you, he, his body is extremely similar to ours. Uh, of course, we humans, we tend to emphasize the differences and we say, well, they have shorter legs or they have more hair. or We tend to emphasize the differences, but... Basically, they are very similar to us. And, and I consider humans also apes. I, I know many people don't consider themselves apes, but essentially that's what we are. So, so I think the comparison with the primates is very obvious in their body language and everything else. Uh, if you go a little bit more distant, if you go, let's say, to elephants or dolphins, yeah, the, the comparison becomes more difficult because they, they have very different bodies. And is there, would you say that there's a use case in studying primates to understand our own culture and society and, and biology and psychology? Like, is there, are there really direct use cases that we can sort of connect and, and correlate between primate culture and, and ours? You mean that we, something that is useful for us? Yeah. I never look at, at studying primates as in order to give advice to people of what to do in their life, you know? Uh -huh. Although... I think the one thing that you can learn from it is that our psychology is not an invention of the human species. Our psychology is a very basic primate psychology. Uh, I think socio-emotionally, we are not different from other primates. We, we love social relationships. We try to be dominant or at least to, to regulate other, the lives of others. We grieve. We, we are jealous. We, we have sexual attraction. And in all these areas, we are extremely primate-like. And so I think it is important for us to, and that's useful, I think, to realize that we didn't invent uh, the human species. The human species is an invention from, of evolution, and, and we are basically primates in that regard. There are a few areas, like intellectual areas, we are, where we are different, but uh, I think uh, our basic emotional lives are very similar. Yeah, interesting. Okay, tell us a little bit about um, the socialization how gender plays into maybe young primates building relationships, uh, the young males building relationships, the young females building relationships. Because you had some very interesting aspects to, you know, sisterhood and how how the females build bonds within the uh, social dynamics that I, I thought was really incredible. Yeah, so the female bonding is especially important in bonobos. So we have two close relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos. They're exactly equally close to us. Science has always been more interested in the chimpanzee than in the bonobo. And that is because the chimpanzee is male-dominated and aggressive and, and fits better with the way of thinking in anthropology where warfare has always been central to the human species and so on. But the bonobos are exactly equally close to us and they have a lot of female bonding. And the females are collectively dominant over the males. They're not individually dominant because they're smaller but they uh, collectively dominate the males. And, and so they have all that female bonding, which is fed by sexual behavior, basically, because the females have a lot of sex between each other. And that's a bonding mechanism that they use to build that strong relationships that they need in order to dominate the males. So it's a very interesting comparison. It's a very big contrast between chimpanzees and bonobos, which also means that the comparison with other primates is not simple, because we have these very different types to compare ourselves with. And there are a few commonalities. I just mentioned the interest of young females in babies, for example. That's something that you find in all the primates. So there are certain commonalities. Males being more aggressive than females, that's also something that you find. So, so there are certain commonalities, but there's also some uh, big variation in the primates. It's interesting, as you're talking about this, what emerges immediately is sort of sex as, I can't remember exactly how you phrased it, but, but sex as a means of bonding, right, mm -hmm. between the bonobos. And the stigma of female sexuality that sometimes emerges culturally, is that, is that something that's very different within, within primate cultures? Like how does female sexuality show up within, um, within primate culture? Because it sounds like within the bonobos, it's, it's kind of a driving force, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, female sexuality has been downplayed in human society, but also by biologists. So we talked about how human culture affects how we look at animals. Now, this is a case of the Victorians telling us that, of course, males want to have sex and they want to have a lot of sex and, and females, they don't care particularly. They accept it when it comes, so to speak. That was their attitude with animals and with humans. And, and it changed only 
when we biologists, we started to um, use DNA techniques to see who's the father of whom. And that's how we found in birds, so not even in the primates. In birds, you have all these monogamous pairs, like a male and a female who built a nest and they have eggs. And we have always assumed that they are monogamous and that the male fertilizes all the eggs. Um, But when we started testing eggs in nests, we found that there was a lot of fertilization by other males going on. (laughs) And, um, And we had to explain that. And people explained that initially by saying, oh, these females, maybe they got raped by somebody uh, somewhere. Uh, But now we know that actually females actively go out of their way to find males. And that's maybe a very smart technique from evolutionary perspective to to, uh, spread your risks, not to have all your your eggs fertilized by the same male, so to speak. So so, uh, we discovered that in birds first and then in the primates, of course, we... We now also know, we talk a lot about what we call female choice. Yes, the males have a hierarchy which affects who gets to mate with females, but the females have preferences as a female choice, and they don't want to mate with every male equally. And so the females also have... So it's it's basically a cooperative affair between males and females because there's very little rape in the animal kingdom. So, So it's usually a cooperative affair, and the female has a big say in that also not just the males. You're talking about the female selection preference or mating preference. Are there differences between the primate species, like between chimps and, and bonobos or gorillas? Like, Are they looking for, for different things in male partners? Actually, you mentioned gorillas. I think there was a recent study showing that gorilla males, who are much bigger than the female, the, the males who are good at playing with, with infants are the ones that the females prefer. Uh-huh. So... There could be selection on that. There could be a female systematically like males who are nice with their kids. That could be a selection pressure on the males. And and I think that is often underestimated um, because males do so little in the primates, usually, with the offspring. They they don't carry them. They don't feed them. They they may protect them, but that's about all they do. Um, But there are observations of both chimps and bonobos where uh, a female loses her life, and so all of a sudden you have an orphan in the group. And these orphans are very often adopted by males, not by females. But females have their own kids. They don't have time for another kid. But uh, by males, adult males, sometimes who adopt them for five years. I mean, they carry them with them, and they become basically their kid. Hmm. Uh, and so males, even though they normally don't show the caring tendencies that you would expect, they have them and they can apply them. And, and I think that's a very interesting observation. I call it a potential. The males have a caretaking potential that is not always expressed. And that's also very important in human society, of course, because we have now all these men who are taking up some family duties that um, the previous generation didn't do. And so there is a shift in society with more caretaking by men. And sometimes that is ridiculed. Uh, so, so you have conservative pundits who say paternity leave. We don't need paternity leave. Maternity leave they can understand, but not paternity leave. I think it is being resisted by some forces, but um, I think it's a very interesting development and it's completely within the biological possibilities of our species, I think. Yeah, there's so many threads in there um, (laughs) that I want to sort of pull on and explore a little bit. I mean, it's interesting. Like I, I took two and a half to three months off. I actually structured my business in a way when my son was born so that I could be completely present for a few months. I would wish that experience for every father, you know, to just have time to to tend. I mean, I got to tend to my wife who needed a good amount of support and to be present with my son when he was born. And it really was a, a wonderful experience. But I remember when I worked at a corporation uh, several years ago, there was a, a gentleman who wanted to take time off to be with his son. And he he was trying to get paternity leave, essentially, when his, his child was being born. And he was up for a promotion within the company. I remember being a part of the conversations where certain people were looking down on this yeah. individual suddenly because he was wanting to take paternity leave. I really, I mean, I really fought for him to take that time off. And I was a little uh, pissed off because I was like, what? Like, what's the difference, you know? Well, that's, so it does- that's, it's a very modern way of thinking because my father's generation, they would have uh, despised someone, a man who would do that. They would have said, wow, oh, what is this? This is for women. This is not for us. We, we have to work every day and, and so on. So, so, so my father's generation of men, I think they, they would indeed look down on that. And then my generation is already a bit more positive on that issue. And then the younger generation... <laughs> 
is really positive about it and 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 enjoys um, being a father. Uh, it, it is such a big shift in society. And I know that that men still don't do 50% of the work at home, but they, they're doing much more than, than they used to. That's for sure. I think it's interesting because, you know, if I would have had to have gone out and worked every day, I would have. I would have done that for, for the family, but I was able to sort of set things up. But yeah, it's interesting. It, does that... There's a biology uh, behind it. There are some neuroscience studies on men uh-huh. who are the primary caretakers of kids. And, and that is sometimes homosexual men. Sometimes they have lost their wife. Sometimes they have chosen to be the primary caretaker. But they do exist, of course. And if you do the neuroscience on them, their brain uh, becomes more maternal. The amygdala is bigger. There's more oxytocin. There's less testosterone. They, they change, basically. There's neuro, neuroplasticity that reflects their behavior. And so we always think that we always think the other way around is that our body and our biology determines our behavior. But what we do in life also determines our biology. And so there is interesting um, data on that. And I think the human species, particularly since we evolved nuclear families where men and women take care of offspring, the human species particularly has that potential of male caretaking. And, and I'm sure since their brain changes, they also enjoy the role. It's, it's not something that is a sort of obligation, but it's something that they enjoy doing, I think. I, I agree entirely. And it's, I've read, that, uh, read some of that research that talks about the decrease in testosterone and the elevation of oxytocin and some of those pieces with men that are, are become the primary caretakers. And it's wildly fascinating. Yeah. Do you feel, this is sort of an off tangent, and we're going to come back and I want to talk about the patriarchy within primate culture and uh, males and alpha and you know because you've done mm-hmm. some phenomenal research and I love your perspective. Do you feel that sometimes your your work is politicized or or just the work in your field in general is sort of utilized for political commentary? Because it seems like it, it almost seems as though sometimes in our attempts as human beings to sort ourselves out and create frameworks that we can live in. We try and pull from data and research to say this is exactly how it is, or you know this is exactly how it's not. I'm curious yeah, to get yeah. your take on that. Yeah, that happens, of course. Is that uh, people say, um, of course, men have a, uh, more to say in society and are more important in society uh, because look at the primates; the males are dominant, and so that's how we need to live. And so they take the, the primate society as an example of how we should live even though you could also find contrary examples, but that's, of course, not what they're looking for. So, yeah, they, they very often use nature. Uh, the whole discussion about whether, whether we should have a, a capitalist, open competition society is often based on how people think nature works, you know, the struggle for life. They, mm. they have a, a view of nature as if it's one place of competition. It's also a place of lots of cooperation, nature. And there's many species, like, let's say, the dolphins, the elephants, the primates, who are highly cooperative animals. But we focus on the competition side and emphasize that in human society. So yeah, there's a lot of projection going on, ideological projection and abuse of biology. And and we biologists, we sometimes participate in that and sometimes we need to go against that. And it's very hard to to make up our minds on that. Um, But but I I feel it is a simplification and and we shouldn't be doing that, but people do that all the time. Did you have, uh, sorry, I promise we're going to get back onto your work and this is, but I'm so fascinated because were you worried at all writing this book in terms of writing a book about gender differences in a time when there's just so much controversy around just the word gender sort of evokes Uh a a lot of emotionality and, and response. And so- was there any concern on your side or, or did you hope on some level that it would sort of support some evening out of the chaos that's emerged around this conversation? Well, I thought actually when I started writing that it, it might upset certain feminists who insist that gender is purely cultural and, and is a very flexible, self-constructed concept, basically. And, 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 and I, I was afraid that they would not want to hear from a biologist. It turns out... Um, The book has generated very little criticism in that regard. Uh, And actually, the the reviews have been quite positive. It's more, I think it's more the people who uh, are conservative, so not the feminists, people who are against gender diversity or um, 
against the LGBTQ community. The, the, those people, they're more upset because I'm explaining how uh, gender diversity can be found in other primates. The, the people who are against transgender people, for example, at the moment, that's such a big issue in, in some political parties. They are the ones who are going to be upset because I describe primates who, let's say, who are born like a female but act more like a male. These things happen in other primates too. And, and I think they are the ones who are more upset than the feminists. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and it's, uh, it, it is wildly fascinating to me that there's so much controversy around something that I, I can't remember exactly if it's like 0.06% of the population that identify as trans. You know, it's... it's, it's yeah, it's, it's 0.6%. 0.6%. It's, it's, it's very small. I think being transgender is largely a biological issue because we know it arises early in life. I think 90% is below the age of seven. So it arises very early and it doesn't change. There was a recent study that said that, that kids who say that they are transgender, they, they don't change their opinion six years later. Uh, and, and so that indicates already that there's some biology behind it. And the big difference with the other primates, uh, believe it or not, that's the biggest difference, is that the other primates never make a fuss about it. And so they have individuals who are more homosexual than heterosexual. They have individuals who don't fit the mold of their gender and don't follow the, the, the role, so to speak, that normally the genders play. And, and I've never noticed that they make um, uh, that they are not tolerated. So, so they're usually very well integrated individuals. Uh, and a human society is different in that they... You, humans are so normative. Mm. So, so that's a big difference with the other primates. We're very normative. If, for example, if you eat with your hands in, 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 a, in a restaurant, you're probably going to be kicked out. Mm -hmm. we, we don't accept that. Even though there are a billion people in India who eat with their hands, that's perfectly fine in their culture, but in our culture, it's not fine. And so um, we're extremely normative. We're sort of ridiculous in that regard. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. So in terms of when you look at the uh, different primate cultures and you see whether it's within the bonobos or the, or the chimps, uh, someone that is maybe homosexual or what have you, you're saying that that primate isn't treated differently socially. No, they, no, no. So there's no, they're just, they're integrated in the culture. Like what, is that, what does that look like in, in terms of when you observe how that individual is treated? It's just, uh, that's, that's how that individual is. It's more like, it's a, it's a personality characteristic. They, of course, all the primates have different personalities, like in humans. And you just accept that this individual is more aggressive than that one, and this one is more sexy than that one. And it's just part of their personality, and I don't think they worry about it. I, I think the only individuals that they would not accept is one who disturbs the peace, who, who's overly aggressive. They, they might have trouble with that. And we have some reports of that kind of individuals being kicked out of society. But uh, other than that, I don't think they worry about it. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. Okay, well, let's let's move away from that a little bit and and move uh, back towards the notion of hierarchy, patriarchy within primate culture, males, dominance, etc. So, are males naturally more dominant? Let's just start with the question. I would first of all make a distinction between physical dominance and power. So physical dominance, yes. The, the males are bigger than the females in most primates. There's a few where they are the same size, but most, mostly they're bigger. And uh, so, yes, physically they then dominate the females. That doesn't mean that females don't have power, because uh, even in a male-dominated society like the chimpanzee, you can have a female. My, my last book was called Mama's Last Hug, but about a female named Mama, who was the alpha female for 40 years in a very large chimp colony. And she was extremely powerful. I don't think a male could become alpha male without her support. She was, to me, together with the oldest male, who was also not alpha male at that point, the oldest male and the oldest female were the most powerful individuals, even though there's then younger males who physically are capable of beating them up and being stronger and so on. So male physical dominance is fairly natural. That doesn't mean that males have most power in this society always, and, and in the bonobos, as, as I've said. The females actually dominate the males. So when you're creating that distinction between physical dominance and power, what are you referring to when it comes to power? Are you talking about social connections, decision-making? Yeah. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, because, because it's a basically a political system. In, in chimps and bonobos and, and many other primates, the power structure is decided by coalitions. 
So the smallest male can be the alpha male because it's decided by who your friends are, who your supporters are. Sometimes it's females, sometimes it's males. The dominant structure is not necessarily the biggest male is dominant. So it's, it's a political structure. And in that political structure, the females can have a lot of power because the females are also part of the coalition system. And if a male abuses everybody and abuses females, for example, an alpha male, he may be kicked out. He may be defeated because the whole group is basically waiting for a challenger. If there then is a younger, younger male who comes up and challenging that uh, abusive male, um, they're going to support the younger male to get rid of him. And so it's a political process, uh, not unlike human democracy. And uh, in that whole process, the females can have a lot of power. Yeah. So even within like a, a chimp culture, for example, is it uncommon for a male to rise to the sort of the alpha of the group just through physical dominance? Or is he having to create a lot of social connections and and sort of act as a more of a social leader than a physical leader. Like, I guess I'm trying to discern because I think for a long time we've held this notion socially or, or within our society, or at least this is my perception of it, that chimps especially have a more dominant alpha figure who is there because he is aggressive and he's assertive and he's physically dominant. Well, it's variable. I would say. One in five males, maybe, in, both in captivity and in the field, gets there by being a bully and being physically very strong and intimidating. And, and if he stays like that, at, when he, when, once he has reached the top, uh, he may become a very unpopular leader. And, and we know of some of these leaders having been killed by the group mm. in the wild and in captivity. So um, it's a strategy that I don't think works so well, but they do exist. Then most of the alpha males that I've known are more like real leaders. They break up fights in the group. They protect the underdog. They protect the young against the old and the females against the males. They can become extremely popular as a result. They become loved by the group because they provide security and harmony to the group. And, and alpha females contribute to that also. Female, alpha females not so much by breaking up fights, but by fixing the relationships afterwards. That's what they do. And, and so these in, these individuals, they can become extremely popular, even though they are the dominant. And, and we always associate dominance with violence, but they're not necessarily violent. So they're actually there to, to curb the violence in the group. And, and we've actually done experiments one time, with, not with, with, the, with the chimps, but with monkeys, where we removed high-ranking individuals from the group for a day at a time. And, and the group really falls apart if these high-ranking individuals are gone, because they're very important for the cohesion of the group. And so alpha males can play a very constructive uh, role. That's why... I'm not always happy with the the way the word alpha male is being used. I, I was the one who introduced it with, with my book, Chimpanzee Politics, and it became very popular in Washington, the mm -hmm. term, and, and it was used in the business world. And if you now look at the business books on alpha males, it's all about how to show that you're dominant, how to get the corner office, office and, and beat up everybody. Uh, it is a very different picture of what for me is an alpha male. A real alpha male for me is a male who keeps the peace and keeps the group together. It has gotten out of hand the, the way people use that sort of uh, a comparison. Yeah, that that was one of the most striking parts of your work. I was listening to an interview as I prepared for this, where you talked about uh, some politician after your work, after that book had come out. I think you said it was Florida Senator Rick Scott who who declared. Men are men and women are women, adding, we believe in science, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> we believe and, in science. Actually, he doesn't believe in science, I believe. But um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, that was actually a more, sorry, that was a more recent one. I think there was a different yeah. politician um, back in the day when your book came out. But that was one of the most fascinating things for me was this notion that alpha male culturally is someone who's creating cohesion mm -hmm. and not necessarily through force. Because I think that that's, generally how you're right i think that's generally how we look at it within our culture today and even when i look at <clears throat> some of the spaces you know that have emerged online like the manosphere and the red pill movement that a lot of uh, men subscribe to there is a good amount of here's a framework for you to operate from that's based on dominance and and hierarchical positioning where social cohesion isn't at the center of it and mm -hmm. I just don't understand how logically, 
psychologically, spiritually, or on any other level, any other plane, that can't be at the forefront of the equation. Because if you are a leader and cohesion isn't a priority, you're just kind of screwed at some point. <laughs> like it just, it just seems like it's probably not going to go well for you at some point down the road. And so I think it's, I think it's a young man's view of leadership. So um, young male chimpanzees also are like that. They, they, when they are, let's say, 16, 17, 18 years old, when they're just getting adult, they go for, for power and violence. Uh, and, they, and they can get quite far with it because everyone is a bit scared of them because they're very intimidating. But they're still no leaders. They, they, that's their view of leadership is to, to beat up everybody. Mm. Uh, and I think that's a young man's view of leadership. As soon as you get a little bit older, and the same is true for chimpanzees, when they get a little bit older, they become more responsible characters and, and they, they adopt a very different leadership style. And, and, and intimidation and physical strength is not necessarily how it is done. If they are good leaders, if they do keep the group together and protect the underdog and all of that, they become so popular that their position actually fortifies. So, so they don't need to use a lot of violence and aggression to stay in that position because everyone loves them and thinks they're, they're doing well. And they want to keep them in that position. And so uh, mm. I think it's much more complex than people think. But th the role of violence, I think that's more for uh, younger males. So how, because I, I really value what you're saying. I am curious about how when those younger males come up, whether it's in a chimp culture or some other primate culture, how does the sort of quote unquote alpha male deal with that? Like, is is there... A time and place for physical dominance where when he's maybe challenged, like what is that what does that look like? How does he maintain his position? Yeah, it's very important that these young males encounter a little bit counterforce. So so the, the most striking story is on elephants. You know, in elephants in some parks in Africa, the, the big bulls have disappeared because of the ivory hunting, because they have the biggest tusks, of course. And so in some of these parks, you have a lot of young male elephants who are growing up without adult males, and they become very unruly. They attack females, they kill females, they kill rhinoceroses, they, they kill a lot of things because they're very unruly and unregulated. And in one of the parks, they introduced some adult bulls. They, they flew them in from other places, uh, fully grown uh, male elephants. And th these males, they only needed to walk around a little. They didn't need to do anything. They only walked around and all of a sudden, the younger bulls became very quiet and their testosterone levels went down and they, they behaved much better than before. And I think the same is true for chimpanzee males, is the, the presence of adult males inhibits a lot of that kind of unruly behavior of the younger males. Again, the, the, these males don't need to do much. They just need to be present. And, and their physical presence already inhibits a lot of that behavior. Same is true for humans. We have a lot of studies on fatherless families. Uh, and we know that fatherless families, there's a lot of difficulty with the boys who become too violent or get into criminal activity and so on. And so I think the presence of adult men or adult males is important for, the, for a normal social development of adolescent males. And, and that is often forgotten. And I think in primate groups, there is a sort of natural regulation going on in that regard. There's so many parallels that I can draw. Like I think in my work, I, I work with a lot of men who have not grown up with a father figure around or, uh, you know, men who have had abusive males as role models, you know, in some way, shape or form, whether they were neglectful or abandoned them or were verbally or physically <clears throat> abusive uh -huh. in some capacity. And it's so interesting how on a, almost on a nervous system level, they are unable to regulate and being around a more mature, grounded man. Like I, I co-lead all of my work with a, a mentor and a colleague of mine who's 72 and he's been doing gestalt therapy for, you know, four or five decades. One of the things that he talks about continuously is the, the value in men being around other men who are able to regulate their nervous system. Mm -hmm. and. And what I almost hear you saying in some ways is something akin to that, is that mm -hmm. when this sort of older, more mature, grounded male who has maybe gone through uh, some of the muck of the, the fighting and, and maybe have, has experienced having an older male present in his life that has had that kind of energy shows up, that that can be 
regulating and almost soothing for the younger males. Is that mm-hmm. r- yeah. roughly accurate to what you're saying? Yeah, I think I think so. There are studies of fatherless families that also, there's also an effect on the girls, by the way, is that girls start to menstruate earlier in a fatherless family. And so they, they get earlier in, into their cycles. And I don't know how that works. That That's some sort of suppression of their hormonal system that comes from the father figure. So, so yeah, I think we, we don't know these situations exactly. It's certainly not a conscious regulation. It's an unconscious process, I'm sure. Uh, but I think it's extremely important. And for example, if you have a, a group of chimpanzees at a zoo and, and they say, we're going to introduce some new males to the group. And, and you know that these males come from a group that has never had adult males. So, so let's say they're, they're 12, 13, 14 years old, adolescent males who have never had um, a strong leader in their group. You know that they're going to be very unruly and potentially ag- aggressive and dangerous. Mm. You, need, you need males who've had a normal development in the presence of adult males. So we all know that in, in practice, in in the zoo business is that you need to watch out for uh, males who, d- who didn't get the right education, so to speak. I love that. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> well, uh, just as sort of a side tangent, and I'm going to come back to what we're talking about. How would you say that studying primates has shifted your perspective or shifted your own persona and personality? Because you seem to have yeah, I've interviewed a lot of people over the years, and you seem to have a very calm, grounded demeanor, but there's also something about you that I wouldn't want to fuck with, for lack of a better term. And so I'm curious if that has, is a byproduct of the, the work that you've done, what you've seen. Do you, do you feel like you've matured in some ways because of what you've witnessed? I'm, I'm just sort of curious on a personal level how the research and the work that you've done has influenced you personally. Yeah, I, I think it has influenced me. And I've always felt very close to animals. And so I've, as a child already, I had many animals. And so I've never seen a sharp distinction between humans and other animals. But I think working with, um, with the primates has, has even fortified that kind of thinking in the sense that um, I'm now at the point that I really look at human society and human behavior as very much primate behavior. And not just in simple things like facial expressions and so on. Uh, but also in the way we deal with issues. And, and for example, at the moment we have the climate crisis and, and, and I find it so fascinating that we are a species that can think ahead. We are very good at projecting uh, forwards and, and thinking ahead. And we're not making use of that capacity. We, we, we're messing up the whole world uh, because we, we, we value immediate gain more than uh, long-term gains. Uh, and that's so primate-like. So I, I look at... Everything that humans do is very similar to what, what I see in the other primates. Hmm. Interesting. So uh, let's just come back on the, the topic of, of males within primate culture. I think that there's sometimes a notion that males are more hierarchical than females. Is that, is that true? Is that something that's maybe a misconception? Like what, what, what do you observe and how would you break that down? I think that's a misconception. So, so in all the animals social animals, not just the primates, we see female hierarchies. The term pecking order comes from hens, not from roosters. And so you take elephants, females, dolphin females, wolves, um, all the primates. Female hierarchies are very common. And an alpha female, the female at the top of the hierarchy, is found everywhere. And they can be very powerful and very intimidating. And so um, we usually, in the primates, we make a distinction between the male hierarchy and the female hierarchy. They're not very integrated. The males worry about their position in the male hierarchy. The females about their position in the female hierarchy. The competition is mostly within gender, not between the genders. And I think in human society, the same. There are a few studies on humans. There are a few studies where they put five men in a room or five women in a room, and they have to figure out some problem. And then they look at uh, the hierarchy that forms. And and it is true that men form a pecking order a bit more quickly than the women, but that's the only difference that we get uh, in the sense Mm -hmm. that both of them do it and both of them form a hierarchy. So I don't know where that story comes from, that that women are not competitive and they're peaceful and they don't have hierarchies. I think it's total bunk. And and if you look at the data, uh, there's actually quite a bit of data on female competition 
Nowadays, there's also data on female bullying at schools. We used to think that bullying was done by boys, but now we know that the girls do it too on Facebook and (laughs) and all sorts of places. And so um, this whole notion that men are more competitive and hierarchical, I think it's total nonsense, but it's still very much around in the... If you you open psychology textbooks, you you find that kind of thing, is that women are more connected and men are more competitive. Uh, And I'm I'm a man who grew up among men and, and I've always been among men and... I, I think, yes, there's a bit of competition, but there's a lot of friendship too. But that's sort of ignored in, in that literature. What are the differences or distinctions between how the males are competing within their hierarchy and how the females compete within theirs? Yeah, one of the big differences, I think, is that males cycle very easily through competition and, f- and friendship and reconciliation. And so they have a fight and, and then... An hour later, they're drinking a beer together and laughing. And the next day, they will have another fight. And they cycle through that very easily. And they forget about it. Whereas women, they they don't forget so easily. And and, and in the chimpanzees, for example, female reconciliation is much less common than male reconciliation. I think But this female strategy is to stay away from rivals and to avoid fights as much as you can. Because when fights occur, it's very hard to fix the relationships, whereas the males don't care, they just cycle through it very easily. And that's, uh, that's very much so in the chimpanzees, and I think it's very much so in humans. And, and I remember one time a discussion with a Dutch swimming coach who had moved from doing the girls swimming to the boys swimming. And they asked her why she had done that. And she said, well, if the girls at the beginning of the season have a big fight, they don't get over it at all for the whole year. And for, with the boys, she said, they have a fight and then tomorrow, they, the, the next day, they barely know anymore that they had a fight. And she found it much easier to deal with. And so that's that sort of similar model w- w- within different primate cultures shows up where chimps or bonobos, the males will have a sort of disagreements or brief conflict between one another. It'll pass quite quickly, but within the, within the female camp, those, would you say rivalries are a little bit more drawn out or how would you describe that? Well, I usually look at it from the conflict resolution perspective and I say that the males have a peacemaking strategy. You have a fight and you make up afterwards. And um, the females have a peacekeeping strategy, like uh, try to try to maintain peaceful relationships and avoid fights because when fights occur, they're bad. And so we, we better avoid them. And so it's two very different strategies of dealing with potential conflict and, and then how it works between the sexes. I don't know. People always ask that how, <laughs> when, for married couples and so on. But it's interesting. <laughs> there, is a, there is a psychologist, John Gottman, maybe you know him, yeah. who has done a lot of work on married couples. And I still remember him saying that you should not look at the number of fights that people have in married couples. That's not a good measure of their their marriage. You should look at what happens after the fights. That's the only good measure that you take is that how do, how do they resolve the issues afterwards? I agree. I agree. He also talks about the importance of appreciation and th- that that's a, a kind of a signal for the, the health and vitality of the relationship, how, yeah, how, yeah. how authentic the appreciation is. What would you say, uh, maybe this is, I'm not really too sure how to word this question, but between the males within the different primate species, what are indicators and signs of healthy relationships between the males, of healthy friendships? Like, what does that look like? Well, the best indicator is always, for me, play behavior. So adult males, even fully adult male chimpanzees, they are still playful. And they pull each other's legs and they push each other and they shove each other and they have play faces, which is a sort of laughing face. And they tickle each other. And if that behavior occurs, then they have good relationships. And and in periods where one male tries to climb to the top, that whole behavior disappears because then there are tensions and there's constantly politicking going on. And then when, when the relationships are resettled and there's a new alpha male, for example, then at some point they become playful again. And that means that they, they are relaxing their relationships. So that's a very good indicator for the males. For the females, I would say it is grooming and being nice to each other's kids. So if 
if females sit in a cluster and they groom each other and they play with each other's kids, that's a very good sign. Then they have good uh, close relationships because females usually don't trust enemies with their with their uh, infants, and so they would keep them away from them. Uh, but if they m- mingle all of that, then, then they have good relationships. Interesting. So play is a very important part of the dynamic. And then, would you say within within the males, like, do you observe them doing anything specific? Uh, that sort of builds the bond or the camaraderie outside of simply just play? Or, is, you know, does, does play fighting have anything to, to do? Or are there any sort of like, I don't know, I want to use the word missions, but that's a very human word. <laughs> but are, is, is there anything that the males are sort of gathering together to do uh, that are, that's supporting the community that's building camaraderie? You know, play fighting is more for younger males. That goes into adolescence, but... Fully adult males, they don't do a lot of play fighting, but they may play in the sense that they run around and they punch each other and stuff like that. I think grooming is also very important for them. And so there's a lot of male-male grooming going on in primate societies. And so that I think that's another way of maintaining these relationships. There are some species, like let's say baboons, where the males never groom each other. And I think there are always tense relationships among those males. They, you know, Robert Sapolsky, the primatologist, He has written uh, entire books about the stress levels of baboons. And I think baboon males, they are very stressed because they don't have these close relationships that you see in, for example, chimpanzees. So that's a very different society. That's very interesting. I remember reading a study years ago, and I was talking about how between men and women, when women embrace and hug, I can't remember if it was oxytocin or dopamine is released almost automatically. And within men, there's a delay of like 10 to 20 seconds that you actually need physical contact longer before the same benefit is is released. And so I'm going to have to go and go mm. and look that up to actually get the fact straights on that. But um, yeah, I think it's, so, it's interesting. So there's another interesting study that was done on humans where with um, security cameras, they just took footage from humans who, who shake hands with each other. What they found is that after shaking hands, people automatically and probably unconsciously, they bring their hand close to their nose. So, so that's as if they're smelling basically the other one, they, they huh. do something like this or whatever. They bring the hand close to the nose. It is done mostly after handshakes within the gender. So when women shake hands with women and man with man, and it's probably a way of, so it's not a sexual thing, probably. It's probably a way of assessing the hostility or friendliness or dominance of the other individual uh, in within gender relationships. So, so we, we underestimate all these, these olfactory things. We, we have a tendency to think that we are a completely visual species, but we do a lot of olfaction also. And, and I think in the other primates, that's very important too. Yeah, I mean, that's such like an animal, animal thing to do, you know? Like that's so interesting that that, uh, that emerged. I, I'm, I'm curious, there's a couple more things before we sort of wrap up that I wanted to, wanted to touch on. One of them was, you know, in the book, you talk about, uh, you have a whole chapter dedicated to violence. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk about the role of violence within primate culture and maybe just some of the misconceptions, uh, some of your observations about where it sort of fits in. I think we've touched on it a little bit, but I think it'd be helpful to discuss that, mm-hmm. that aspect of it. Yeah, especially in relation to rape. So, so people sometimes assume that rape is an animalistic thing. And uh, because, we, you know, as soon as we reject a certain behavior, we call it animal behavior. Uh-huh. And so we have a tendency to do that. Uh, but rape is actually very uncommon in the animal kingdom. So there are a few species, the, the orangutan, the younger males, not the fully adult males, but the younger males, they sometimes rape a female. And there are certain flies that do it, the ducks do it. But you can basically name the species that uh, show rape behavior. It's, it's not particularly common. And in chimpanzees, it's extremely rare. I, I must have observed maybe a thousand copulations among chimpanzees and have never seen a rape. And in bonobos, it's totally absent because in the bonobos, the females dominate and so it will not happen. So, so rape is actually more a human behavior, I would say, than a primate behavior. And I think in humans, it's maybe promoted by the way we live. We have houses or huts and we live in a family environment that is isolated from the rest. And so um, a man is alone with a woman and and, and can do these kind of things without interference from the outside. 
which is not possible in a primate group. They're, in primate groups, um, usually females are, have, a, have a solidarity against that kind of behavior and mm. will try to prevent it. And so in our species, it's maybe more common because of the nuclear family arrangements that we have. And that's one, one circumstance in which it happens. The other one, we see that now at the moment during the war between Ukraine and Russia, Russia we see that also during war, rapes happen. And that's a totally different context. And I don't know how our species got into the habit of doing that kind of things, but that's a very common context also nowadays. Yeah, that would be that would be an interesting one to research and study from a psychological perspective, although I don't know exactly how you would do that, but it does seem to be quite a bit more prominent and, and, and common. Does anything like that show up within, because I know I've seen sort of extreme videos of chimp uh, societies clashing, right? It's sort of like one tribe and another tribe getting into yeah. conflict and, and really extreme violence can occur uh, within those clashes. And so can you speak to that? Because that seems to be maybe an example of, of something that, that transpires. Yeah, so, so chimpanzee males are extremely territorial. They're never friendly to the males in the other territory. I don't think they do much with the females in the other. They actually would welcome them in their group. I don't think it's aimed at the females. That's actually quite unusual. It's mostly male-to-male -male violence. It's very different from bonobos, where groups can mingle. Two groups can meet and mingle. It's because the females like to mingle with the females of the other group, and, and they groom them, and they have relations with them. In chimpanzees, there is a high level of violence between groups. It's also culturally variable. So, so you should realize that, that most of the stories we hear about chimpanzees and most of the programs on TV you see about this kind of violence, they come from East Africa. So the East African chimps are like that. The West African chimps is much less of that kind of behavior. So, so there's a cultural variation. But yeah, it, it, chimpanzee males can be very violent to other males, that's for sure. That's fascinating. I mean, I feel like there's a whole rabbit hole there in terms of the variances between the like different cultures of where chimps are living. And that, that's a whole other conversation, I feel. Uh -huh. well, one of the things that I wanted to start to close out on, and maybe I should have gotten into this at the beginning, was you talk about how the more that we learn about biology, the more that it may lead to gender equality. I think there's something along those lines, I believe I'm paraphrasing. Why is that? Why, what do you think is the intersection between being able to study biology and, and leading to a deeper sense of gender equality or, or at least gender acceptance and understanding? Well, I think um, in the discussion about gender equality, and I agree that there is inequality in society and that it's to the detriment of women more than men, for sure. So in that discussion, I think, People have focused on the wrong problem. They have said gender is the problem. We need to get rid of genders. We need to be gender neutral. We need to reduce gender differences. I'm not against reducing gender differences, but I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem is the inequality and the injustice of it. So we need to work on the, on the political side, on the inequality side, and how do we eliminate that? I don't think it's bad to have two genders or to have even more than two genders or multiple genders. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, that or that there's a problem. It's the inequality that's the problem, and we should focus on the problem and not on gender-neutral raising of children, which is fine up to the age of 10, but as, as you just mentioned, adolescence is very... <laughs> when, when people hit puberty, there's, there's going to be differences, and there's going to be substantial differences. For example, in size and strength and cycles and hormones, there's, there's, there's an enormous amount of differences that come up in that time and yeah, you can raise your kids gender neutrally, but uh, you're going to hit those differences anyway. So um, I, I think people have been focusing on the wrong problem. The problem is the inequality and, and we need to get rid of it. But we can do that without abolishing genders, I think. So after studying primates for so long and sort of seeing the biological differences, are, are there things that, that we maybe culturally can begin to accept about gender? or understand about gender that, that maybe are, I don't, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for. I'm like totally blanking on the word, but. Well, I, well, I think if you, if you look at the biology of the primates, there's two things that I would want to emphasize. Is one is that female leadership is really not hard to find in the primates. Mm -hmm. And so when people have stories about males need to be leaders because they are better at it or it's more natural for them, 
I think that's total nonsense. Female leadership can be found in all the primates, and there's really no reason why we should emphasize male leadership more than female leadership. So that's one. The other one is, we, we discussed this, is that male parental care is not always found in all the primates, and in some primates it's actually almost completely absent, but the males have a potential to do that. We know that from, from the adoptions that we have seen in the wild and in captivity. And so um, we should not under, underestimate the potential for men to be caretakers for children. Mm. Uh, it's not something unnatural, in my opinion, it, is that potential is clearly there. And, and if we want in our society, we can exploit that potential and, and increase it. So, so I think biology does give us a, a view of a bit more flexibility in society than we thought we had or then conservative forces say we have. And, and, as, and, and so I'm an optimist in that regard. I think in the other primates, we can see a, a lot of things that can be done right and that we're not doing maybe in our society. You mentioned the female leaders within uh, primate cultures. Have you noticed a difference between what male leadership looks like versus female leadership? And maybe that's opening up a different can of worms, but I'm curious to... I've done a few podcasts recently on female leadership, about, about, of course, about human society, mostly. What is missing, because I've read a few books on that issue also, what I miss in that discussion is assertiveness of women. So... All the female alpha, alpha females that I know in primate groups, they are assertive. They are not soft and gentle and kind to everybody. They have the top position and they want to keep the top position and they will punish females who go against them. Uh, so they are assertive. In the, in the literature of female leadership in humans, I, I miss all of it. They always present it as kind and empathic and wonderful leaders. And that cannot be true. I don't think you can be the boss of a, of a corporation, a woman boss, and not be assertive in one way or another, or, or, mm. or let everyone know that you're the boss. So, so um, that element is sometimes missing. I think that's because of the narratives in our society that women are nicer than men, and I'm not convinced of that. But um, mm. yeah, I, I think it's, it's a sort of biased observation that's going on. Yeah, it's interesting. I have... Um... Uh, I just had Richard Reeves on the show who wrote a book called On Boys and Men. You heard of that mm-hmm. one? Yeah. No, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's a, it's, he's, a, he's a researcher at the Brookings Institute, and he's done this whole, uh, written this incredible book about how when we ignore biology in our culture, you know, our, our, our gender suffer because of it, right? And the gender equality in the way that is sort of being presented becomes very challenging because we, we do ignore the biological differences. Mm-hmm. And he's sort of talking about how, you know, young men's prefrontal cortex develops slower. And so the education institutions are, are sometimes not what we're finding out, not necessarily geared towards young boys, et cetera, et cetera. It is a, a wildly fascinating uh, uh, piece. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting to hear your perspective on all of this. I want to close out by first off, just thanking you for this wonderful, wonderful conversation. This was truly fascinating and enlightening. And there's so many different pathways that we could go down. There's other, you know, sort of strings that I wanted to pull on, but anything that you would like to leave the listener with in terms of something that maybe we didn't cover or something that you haven't discussed about the book or the research in other shows that you think is absolutely imperative to know about? No, I, I, I think we've covered a lot of things. and I, I, I'm just sorry that it's not simple. People want simple answers. They want to hear from a primatologist, what is the biology of gender? And, you know, the primates are also cultural beings and, and humans are also biological beings. And we have these two close relatives who are not the same. And, and so it is a complex story. But I think we should look at gender as a complex story. It is, it is not simple. And people who try to simplify it, uh, either for their own uh, progressive purposes or conservative purposes. Uh, I think they're misleading. Uh, it, it is a very complex issue. And there's a lot of diversity also. And each individual is a bit different from the rest. Uh, I think we're forgetting that, that it cannot be simplified. Uh, and so th- that's my message is that it is a complex issue. Uh, but I, th- I do think the other primates tell us a story about it for sure. I, I agree. And I think that's one of the things that I actually really love about your work and your message is the reinforcement of the nuance between the two, um, mm-hmm. you know, within this conversation of biology and, and gender and how, how enriching that can be, you know. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. DeWall, for joining me You're on welcome. this conversation. 
For everyone out there listening, don't forget to minute forward, share the episode with somebody that you know is going to enjoy it. We'll have all the links to Dr. DeWall's uh, book and work in the show notes. So go check that out. And until next week, this is Connor Beaton signing off.